they can tell us about the situation on the ground in Russia and the repression of civil society that's happening in the, and the working conditions for NGOs like Memorial and lawyers like themselves. So um, thank you. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you for coming. Um, <coughs> I think that uh, I should start with a question. Um, to what extent are you aware of the situation of human rights defenders in Russia? Because should we start, maybe should, should we start from the very beginning, or you already know something about it's probably a big mix, I would thought. Yeah. I think it's quite a range. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I have to make a, not a very good idea, but some. Um, it doesn't look very good. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, oh, I work at the Human Rights Centre Memorial, and in the last 10 years, uh, one of our colleagues was murdered. Uh, two other colleagues were criminally prosecuted under fabricated uh, charges of uh, drug possession and um, producing child pornography. Um, our organization is to pay around, is, or is already to pay around, um, uh, a fund of around 20,000 pounds um, under foreign agents law, and it's the non-final sum because um, in the next few weeks the sum will <coughs> um, increase for, for around the pink uh, uh, 25 or 30, uh, 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 up to 25 or 30 thousand pounds. Uh, this is a very brief <laughs> description mm -hmm. of the conditions um, <coughs> uh, of our work. Uh, one of the most, uh, one of, uh, as I said, one of the most uh, important problems affecting our work is uh, the second foreign agents law, of which Jess uh, uh, has mentioned. Um, Several years ago, a, colleague, a then colleague of mine, Kirill Kratev, um, said that this law is vague, it strikes randomly, disproportionately, and to the pleasure of the um, ex executive. Um, at that time, this law was not applied, this uh, uh, hasn't been applied yet, but uh, we had an understanding of how it will be implemented. Uh, by now, we can say that uh, Kirill was absolutely right, <laughs> because um, this law alleges that any NGO that is involved in uh, political activities um, and receives foreign money, money um, declares themselves as uh, a foreign agent. Uh, a foreign agent in Russia, uh, there is a, very, a common understanding that foreign agent means a spy. It's not so... it's not... Um, uh, a definition uh, that uh, it's not a label that uh, one would put uh, on themselves uh, voluntarily. Um, however, uh, what does a political activity mean? A political activity is any NGO activity that you can imagine. Um, any application to the authorities, um, any um, Collecting information about uh, public opinion on any issue, um, at least even distributing any publications, can be uh, considered a political activity. What is foreign money under this law? Uh, foreign money is not on money uh, directly coming from abroad. And when saying from abroad, uh, we mean bo uh, uh, any foreign NGO, any foreign government, any foreign citizen. But it's also, uh, in some cases, we, we have cases where uh, funding coming from <coughs> a Russian NGO, which in its turn receives money from abroad, was declared as foreign money. And even uh, when the money didn't come directly to the bank accounts of the organizations, but for example, uh, an organization receiving foreign money paid for some bills of another Russian NGO, it was also uh, uh, declared as foreign funding. So um, the thing is that any NGO that has money with, um, how to say it, uh, with some 
uh, that, that has uh, at any point of time been foreign money um, can be declared a foreign agent. Uh, the a foreign uh, agent organization must uh, uh, report to the uh, must file additional report to the um, government to the authorities must uh, undergo annual audit, uh, which is a very expensive thing in Russia. For example, if a large uh, larger NGOs can afford it, smaller NGOs just simply can afford it. Uh, and uh, the most uh, uh, notorious thing about this law is, is that uh, the foreign agent NGOs must label all their publications uh, which are published or dis disseminated by them. So, for example, if an NGO uh, disseminates uh, the Bible, if a foreign agent NGO disseminates the Bible, in any case, uh, <laughs> it should uh, label this Bible um, as a publication disseminated by a foreign agent. Uh, Omnipotent foreign agent, presumably. <laughs> Sorry? An omnipotent <laughs> foreign agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Yes, please. The law doesn't specify what constitutes a publication and how the label should look like. Um, until recently, uh, de facto labeling requirements were limited to the uh, printed publication disseminated by the organization and the organization's official website. However, uh, in recent months, um, <clears throat> administrative offence cases regarding the absence of such labels were initiated against several NGOs, including Memorial, uh, for the absence of these labels on social networks. So uh, we got um, two of um, the uh, uh, proceedings were initiated not only against the organizations themselves but also against the head of the organizations. So uh, we are now uh, in the process of getting two fines for each social network <coughs> which was not labeled. Uh, interestingly, if uh, so we get fines even in cases when we are not, um, uh, when uh, the person, uh, when no one could get any information from our social network. For example, our Ingushati office has a Facebook page, they do not post anything uh, on it, they post only links to our public, to, to the publication on our official website, so you cannot uh, get any information from the Facebook page. You should go to our official website, which is labeled with a foreign agent label. However, we got two fines for not labeling that Facebook page. Um, my opinion is that uh, what is being done right now, it's uh, an attack uh, because uh, uh, this uh, new uh, the, the sanctions are used not only against Memorial but also against uh, several other uh, human, uh, large human rights organizations that managed to survive the first wave of uh, persecution under the foreign agent law. Uh, so my opinion is that uh, the um, purpose of these persecutions is very simple and it uh, is to put financial pressure, uh, so to make the organization pay that many uh, funds so that they couldn't survive, so they couldn't survive just financially. Uh, another example, uh, another uh, um, uh, thing that can be that, that uh, might happen to this uh, to uh, um, our organization is um, the Sobe. The organization for numerous uh, after these fines are imposed uh, is dissolving the organization for numerous violations of the legislation, because um, according to Russian legislation, numerous violations of any federal law can lead to dissolving an organization, and uh, this is what uh, has already happened to. Uh, um, a large human rights organization, one of the uh, most prominent human rights organizations that existed since 1997, um, namely uh, Zaprova uh or for human rights. Uh, uh, this organization 
was sued by the Ministry of Justice uh, for, and there were two reasons for this suit. One was minor uh, regulations in the organization's reporting to the authorities. And when I say minor regulations, I mean, uh, for example, that uh, they used a, a number and their charter didn't uh, include the description of this label, of this emblem. Or, for example, their official address, uh, you, they used the official address, we did not correspond uh, by the official address of the building uh, according to the state register. So, um, these are um, really minor regulations. And the other reason for uh, the Ministry of Justice to do them were, was that the fact that they were fined uh, seven times for violating this prohibitions law mm -hmm. into, uh, in 2019. So in 2019 they were uh, first fined seven times and then the uh, Ministry of Justice sued them uh, and uh, in November the uh, Supreme Court uh, delivered a judgment stating that the organization should be dissolved. Mm -hmm. Of course, they are um, appealing the actual judgment, and, but we don't know um, what the outcome of the appeal hearing will be. Uh, the situation in the uh, of uh, uh, our, uh, of uh, this is uh, the, like the general situation of human rights defenders in the country. <coughs> the situation uh, in the regions is even worse because in large cities like Moscow and Saint Petersburg, um, a civil society where civil society is active, uh, um, there is a community of activists of human rights defenders, and uh, the pressure by the society is not that uh, strong. However, in the regions, especially in the North, uh, in the North Caucasus, um, mm, it uh, is much stronger. And uh, the uh, worst example, of course, is Chechnya, because in Chechnya, uh, by now, uh, there is not a single uh, human rights organization that has an office in Grozny. And um, several years ago, there used to be at least three organizations that had offices. The namely Memorial, uh, Committee Against Torture, and Citizen Justice Mission. Um, Committee Against Torture had to close their office in Grozny after uh, numerous attacks. Uh, and uh, Memorial, was, uh, which was the last organization to have an office there, had to, we had to close our office after the head of our uh, Grozny office, who used to keep, was arrested and charged with drug possession. Um, just, uh, I think that you might have heard about this case, but just to, uh, uh, for you to understand whether, this, <laughs> whether th this could be a real case. Ayub, uh, at the moment of his arrest, Ayub was 60 years old. He is a practicing Muslim, and uh, he has been heading our Grozny office for 10 years by that time. So the, um, chance that he did have marijuana, uh, 180 grams of marijuana with, with him uh, in Grozny is really, really low. Um, um, Yub was found guilty. Um, however, due to the uh, pressure, due to international, uh, uh, both uh, uh, international and um, Prussian, uh, Prussian inside Russia, the uh, sentence he was got was relatively mild. He got four years of imprisonment and was released on parole after serving a year and a half. Uh, so, but in any case, uh, the, his uh, arrest and prosecution led uh, to closing our office in Grozny. So, by now, there is not a single Human rights organization having an office there. At the same time, uh, really grave human rights violations, including enforced disappearances, executions, and torture, continue uh, there. And 
our we are doing no work on Chechnya, but our uh, opportunities even to get information from there and are uh, not um, to say to handle cases there um, very very low right now so and the only opportunity to handle a human rights case in Chechnya now is to hire a lawyer uh, working uh, that leaves uh, that, that that is not uh, Chechen ethnically uh, and uh, that leaves somewhere outside uh, North Caucasus that would travel <coughs> for the hearings or um, for some other <coughs> legal activities um, and then um, go back to Moscow to some other um, city uh, I think that that is the general situation uh, Marina is planning to add something about uh -huh. okay pages. so idea ideally at the very beginning I wanted to uh, talk about uh, what uh, what are we doing and uh, how do we kind of survive under this um, under this uh, pressure but uh, I was thinking that there will be uh, somewhat more students uh, that would be interested in this kind of area however I see that there are not so many students so I'll just continue a bit uh, on drawing the uh, general background and then I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing and how do we survive. So uh, Tania has been talking about um, legislation that was almost specifically targeted, uh, drafted to target uh, NGOs. Um, and this is one way how the authorities are um, putting pressure on us and uh, trying to make us disappear. Uh, there is another way, however, and which is uh, using a, a neutral legislation, say, uh, there is a very famous case, it's called Golos uh, case. Golos is called, uh, it's a Russian term for voice. And uh, that's, this is an organization that has been um, um, monitoring elections, making sure that the elections are done in a fair way. And uh, you would think that this is a good goal, right? Uh, elections should be fair and nobody could argue against that, right? Um, however, in this case, uh, Golos was getting uh, funded uh, from the United States. And they have this special agreement, a donation agreement. Uh, and um, this donation agreement had this one provision saying that in case uh, the activities <coughs> of the organization receiving a donation uh, will uh, contradict to the U.S. national interests, then this donation agreement can be cancelled, which is a fairly nice thing, right? It's you could expect this thing to be in a in a donation agreement. However, then the Russian authorities were like, hmm. But this agreement has not been cancelled. That means that it was in line with the U.S. national interest. And the U.S. national interest may contradict the Russian national interest, which means that the donation was not made uh, with the goal to benefit the entire society, which is the prerequisite, uh, legal prerequisite for having a donation agreement. And therefore, they said that uh, it doesn't benefit the society as a whole, uh, and therefore they uh, requalified this donation agreement and decided that it's not a donation, it's a regular contract. Therefore they put the, uh, they counted the taxes, donation agreements are tax-free. Here they counted the taxes and they had huge taxes um, to pay. The organization was not able to pay the taxes because nobody expected that um, after three years uh, the agreement was over. Then the director of this uh, office had to be, was, um, and is still is, criminally liable for failure to pay taxes. So um, she, has, she gets a very small pension from the state, from which uh, a, a big, big chunk is reduced because she has to pay this kind of taxes that were imposed on her, sort of, illegally. Um, so, um, and this is a relatively neutral legislation, but uh, it has been twisted in such a way that, um, you know, like, what, what can you do with that, right? And uh, therefore, <coughs> the memorial is, uh, for instance, right now planning a crowdfunding campaign, uh, because, as Tatiana said, now we have to pay big fines for not labeling our, our publications. You know, like, this is something that we have to <coughs> bear in mind, that mm -hmm. Even if we apply all the laws as carefully as we can, but still there is this possibility of twisting the law. So we have to put the margin into, uh, into the donation that we get and put it aside, uh, understanding that at some point the authorities might come 
um, and then we will be liable and we'll have to pay this money. So this is something that um, we just have to be very careful about. Um, another case, another uh, case where a fairly neutral legislation uh, has been uh, misapplied is um, unfortunately an example of again memorial organization that is dealing with the um, um, taking care of uh, sites where people who were murdered during Soviet repressions are buried. So we're talking right now in about the region in Russia, which is called Perm. And uh, Perm is known, uh, historically known, uh, for because it's been the place where there, is, um, there were gulag camps. And so obviously the gulag camps and also people who were uh, placed there as a part of uh, uh, Stalin's um, Stalin's actions to move uh, people from where they've been settled before. So um, people were there. Uh, of course, there were people who died when they were moved uh, to this, uh, forcibly moved to these places. Uh, there are, um, you know, mass graves of these people. And um, unfortunately, the state doesn't take care for these mass graves and it doesn't even recognize these mass graves as cemeteries. So uh, there are people who were willing to take care of this for these uh, mass graves, and they are coming and uh, cleaning the um, the site uh, to make sure that there are no bushes, that there are no let's say trees. Uh, so you know to make it look nice. And then um, it's been happening this year when uh, an expedition with foreigners came um, and foreigners are the relatives of those people who are buried there. So this expedition came and then they were cleaning the site. They were, you know, just uh, making sure the grass is nice and um, uh, painting uh, whatever they installed, the monuments. And then uh, now they are being criminally prosecuted for uh, cutting the trees that they never did. And uh, also uh, taking this site into their own possession, meaning that they have installed many years ago this monument. Uh, to commemorate uh, the memory of those people who are buried there, and uh, which was actually the obligation of the state, but the state didn't do it, so they had to do it, but now they are being held liable for taking the slot into their possession. Um, and um, this is something, uh, again, that we have to uh, respond, and um, it's, you know, it's difficult uh, to have in mind that the, this le the legislation, fairly neutral legislation, can be twisted in this way. So, like, we need to, we, um, sometimes um, our work reminds me, maybe you remember this kind of game, um, it was popular in the 90s, where there was this, you know, this m m small electronic games where, you where a wolf had to catch uh, eggs, right? Mm -hmm. So, this is sometimes what it reminds me. We don't even know which eggs is coming at us and where we've got to put the basket <coughs> because they it could be coming from any direction. So Marina, in that instance, do you th is it your do you think that was there was a general intention to use the law for that for that purpose initially or even recently or do you think it's just say one official that's doing his own thing and getting it wrong? Well I think that's um, the an, an official that is doing its own his or her own thing. And uh, normally we understand that um, it, it is happening where the authorities are sort of against um, memorial activities. And uh, in this particular case, it, you know, we knew that the authorities there in Kudimkar uh, were against. Uh, yeah, but the same thing. Yeah, all uh, these prosecutions uh, that Tanya has been talking about, about the fines that memorial has to pay. We understand that um, there was a very specific authority behind uh, these prosecutions because they applied, uh, they uh, sort of complained about the fact that we don't label our website or our social media networks. And that authority was a federal security office in Ingushetia uh, where there were uh, protests uh, and um, although Memorial didn't have anything to do with the protests, but somehow now the Federal Security um, um, Bureau is um, prosecuting any NGOs, including not only Memorial, but any NGOs working in the region, just to make sure that we are not there anymore. So, um, what's, uh, there's a, always a question, where do we, 
why do we still want to pursue our goals and why are we still here um, so um, there is um, when we have this kind of cases like the Golos case the text case I was talking or Pierre Memorial uh, case about the cut trees um, there's always um, what we're trying to do is that although it, we, it seems like the authorities are entirely against us we're trying to figure out which uh, which authorities can help us uh, although it's very difficult to do uh, but mm -hmm. sometimes you get a very unexpected uh, help uh, for instance in this Golos text case um, so I told you about this one instance where uh, a director of that Golos was fined and criminally held criminal, criminally liable for not paying the tax but there was another spin-off of this case in another region where there was the same kind of agreement and another director and then um, apparently there was we have this advisory board uh, for our president that wrote to the court that to have a fair elections it's actually the goal that benefits the whole society so don't think that the donation agreement that they signed was against this kind of um, goal beneficial to the society and the court cited this uh, cited this um, statement as a uh, valid uh, evidence mm -hmm. uh, and therefore said that this donation agreement cannot be qualified uh, as breaching this this goal and therefore the donation agreement was not requalified and the tax w uh, they didn't have to pay taxes so this is uh, a very challenging task to identify which authorities are still able to help us and get their um, um, their willingness and get them on board and um, another thing is that um, which for me is very challenging is to identify what is possible among all of those that is impossible <coughs> because um, this year we had um, several cases which we won on the Supreme Court level um, where or yes on the Supreme Court level or even a little bit lower but it just took us many years for for a relatively simple case like we won a case um, to get access to archives um, that were formed during Stalin's era and that's been 85 years past since that time so you would think that archives should be open however they were not open and uh, the law was clearly on our side but the, 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 the three we went to four different courts the first second the first the second the third and the fourth instances court so we won on the fourth instance uh, on the final level but uh, the, uh, the courts of three instances uh, said that you know we don't have this right and then we were really surprised when uh, when we were uh, arguing in the Supreme Court our opponent which is the Ministry of Interior they said oh but we actually think that uh, the well uh, the, our colleagues misapply the law and actually we agree with this complaint that you lodged so they kind of like said that they were mistaken although the courts it took us th one and a half years to actually get to the Supreme Court for a relatively simple case so uh, it's just and it was my belief that this case was possible so we have to fight because we have limited resources and we have to pick our fights so in this case I said okay we, we can fight and maybe there, there is still hope so and but to figure out which is impossible from which is possible is fairly um, enormous exercise <coughs> and uh, when there is a case coming up to us we all think whether whether there's something um, could be done on national level and we have to like, use all the forces that we have um, or we can just technically uh, exhaust domestic remedies and be fine with that so this is a big challenge for us and here I can put my talk and um, we, we will be willing to answer any of your questions that you might have thank you that was really interesting does anyone have any questions the term graves Marina you were talking about they so that from what you said it suggests that the, the, the families know that their relatives are buried <coughs> there is that because records were kept at the time, do you know? I mean, so there, there are these, the, the, the old graves from the time of the gulag in the 30s. Well, it, 
people know that the relatives are buried there or not? Or is it a mix? Well, uh, people know that uh, their relatives have been put in a particular place. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, near this place, there is this um, uh, sort of mass grave. And we know that people uh, who were uh, who died during this time in this mm. particular place was mm. buried there. Okay. We don't have official records who is buried there, but we know from you know we also talk normally <coughs> with the people who live in this area to figure out whether they you know what they know about this. Yeah. So there is, it, it, to my knowledge, there is no written record of who is buried there. Uh, it's just kind of knowledge that it should their bodies should be there. Mm. So they're not, they've never been exhumed. Is it po would it be possible to exhume those graves or under, under the law or the system at the moment, or, or not? I haven't thought about that. Um, maybe yes, but there is always this question, what for? Mm. And to, to conduct an expertise, an, exp an expert opinion. Mm. So we, like this is a big question. And um, Tanya mentioned um, the case of Yuri Dmitriev, who is uh, Russia, who is memorial leader in uh, another region, which was the northern region, Petrozavodsk region. Yeah, Petrozavodsk region. Uh, so he, what he was trying to do is that uh, there were mass graves uh, with a lot of uh, bones and hats um, there, uh, and he also had this kind of um, lists uh, of people who were shot during the time. Um, of these repressions. So what he was trying to do is that he had this list. He knew that these people are buried here, somewhere here, and uh, he was trying to match the people who are in the list with those people who are in graves. So he was trying to make an, it an itinerary for each grave. And I don't even know how he was able to do that, but somehow he was able to do that. So he was definitely say to me, uh -huh. what it is, um, because he was he first, at first he found he did found these graves because uh, what he knew at the beginning of his research was that there are mass graves of Stalin's era somewhere in this forest. But they're not yeah. marked. They're not marked. Yeah. And so uh, what did he do first? He found the graves, and uh, now uh, people people know where uh, uh, the victims are buried and uh, every year uh, in August um, some memorial events take place there. And do they know how many people are in each mass grave? Well, they do know. Uh, yes, this <coughs> information is in the yeah. archives. And there's uh, also, just to add uh, some spices to that, uh, you, the way how he found this mass graves is pretty unusual and uh, I would say extremely interesting. So, um, nobody knew where the mass graves are, but uh, the population didn't kind of know either because those people who were who, who could have known they were mm -hmm. sort of dead. Uh, and therefore, he, the question that he was uh, asking the population was, what is the bad place where you, mm -hmm. where you would never go? And then they would tell him, where, where is this bad place that would never know, they, they, where they would never go? And this is uh, how he That's sort of got got the area and then he also looked uh, on this area uh, at the trees because the trees that were uh, where the people were buried they were different from the way how from the other trees because they were younger mm -hmm. and therefore he was able to also kind of narrow down the search area and that's then he started um, digging and then we found and then he, uh, uh, in one of his interviews, he said that uh, when when he was asked, well, "How did you find this first place?" Well, when that when I identified the area, I just walked and thought, "Where would I bury many people if I had to?" Yeah. <laughs> and he, uh, when he just uh, looked at the area, he and said that I would do that here, mm -hmm. and he started digging there. And did he did yes. by himself, or just with a spade or something? <laughs> Right? He did yeah. by himself at this yes, place? Yes, he, yeah. did, he did everything yeah. by himself. And what was his link to, was it just interest or did he have some familiar link? Oh, he's a historian, right, isn't he? he well, he's a self, self-taught historian, mm -hmm. so he was just, you know, interested, interested, yeah. in, interested in that. And nobody tried to prosecute him for taking ownership of anything? Uh, well, <laughs> it was in the 90s <laughs> when uh, it was sort of uh, on vogue uh, and then yeah. therefore no, nobody tried to prosecute him. And then how did he, by himself, make a link between the bones he found and the identities of the people? Well, uh, in archives he knew uh, which 
people uh, okay so um, you, what you would have in the archives is uh, a list of people shot in this particular day oh, okay. okay right or like in this particular time frame yeah. then uh, you would uh, try to uh, dig the grave and then try to find um, evidence for instance there's a newspaper um, marking uh, the newspaper found in the bones uh, with this particular date and then you kind of uh, take this newspaper and compare to when the people were shot right. so it, you know kind of this yeah. evidence not DNA no, no no no, no. <laughs> <coughs> um, have you it's kind of more broadly not uh, just about memorial I guess but have you seen a generational shift in um, attitudes to human rights and application of human rights and if there is one um, has it impacted how you approach your work um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so of course the uh, understand if I understood your question correctly, of course the understanding of human rights uh, by the older people, uh, older people um, uh, differs from the understanding of uh, by younger people. For example, uh, like many uh, older human rights defenders in Russia are not in a big favor of. LGBT rights, women's rights, but I think uh, it's the same all across the globe. <laughs> not a, it's not a specific uh, Russian issue. Uh, but uh, the understanding of uh, the younger uh, generation of activists, of human rights defenders, is different. Um, we have, uh, moreover, uh, the uh, younger human rights defenders, for example, um, younger activists, they establish uh, uh, organizations uh, in order to protect the rights of sex workers, of drug users, and so on, uh, which is unimaginable for the I think uh, for the four memorials uh, <laughs> founders. It, for them, for them, it was absolutely something absolutely uh, unimaginable. But uh, by now. We do have uh, some uh, organizations that protect these groups of people in Russia, but uh, uh, many of them are not registered because <laughs> our government is also not a big favor of all human rights. And of course, uh, it's uh, even um, in less favor of human rights of marginalized groups. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you also, your question was also about how do you. Um, how do you address uh, different uh, different audiences, right? In, in our work. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if it's impacted how you approach your yeah. like your work, either in cases that you've taken on or ways that you've kind of um, publicized about it or try to engage with people. Well, um, definitely, since we understand that um, the younger generation is more prone uh, to believe uh, in human <coughs> rights and take it as a value. Then uh, we try we try to ta target this uh, population. Particularly, there is a project called Overdame Fall. They are dealing with um, public rallies, and uh, what they're trying to do is that uh, they try to use as many cartoons, as many you know visual content, <coughs> with various pictures uh, as possible uh, to make sure that you know it's it's. Uh, we're talking. Well, um, in my opinion, the best approach to deal with the very difficult uh, issues is to make them a little bit soft. So by using cartoons, by using by using humor, uh, they can, uh, in my opinion, they can reach a much broader population. Um, also, what we are trying, uh, what we are thinking right now is that we are uh, building an outreach campaign about um, public rallies. And the fact that you cannot really uh, hold a public rally. So what we're trying to do is that we are trying to come up with a sort of a game um, that people could, uh, younger generations could play, for instance, um, organize a rally or like um, escape a policeman, you know, like whatever. Um, this is um, an approach. Good family fun. What's that? Good family fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like uh, this, um, these issues are in our mind. However, of course, you know, it's we are not a large co corporation, we don't have the resources to develop a new video game, but you know, something fairly simple could be done as well. Mm -hmm. um, about, about this point, first of all, I think Amnesty did something, uh, they, had a, they had a project uh, about also like 
in a very visual format about the European court uh, case law on um, on freedom of association, yeah, freedom of association, and uh, I think they did some, and and also something around protests as well. So basically, they took examples of European court cases, and then they did like a quiz based on a comic where you would have to identify where the sort of where the violations mm. of the European Convention mm. are. So that's the first example, and the second example is. There is an app on uh, Google Play, I think, that is called Gebnia. Uh, Gebnia. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, which is like a slur term for KGB, uh, and um, which is basically also like a test. Uh, so, so it's almost like a yeah, it's it, it's basically a game where you play either as a student or as a businessman who is targeted by a search, and then you have to like make all the right cho choices not to end up in jail. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, maybe you you would want to cooperate uh -huh. with the people who did those things. Yeah. And then maybe. if no one else has has a question, I want to ask one. Uh, so about the creative application of uh, legislation in a repressive way, did you notice any trends or tendencies in terms of like, at which level those ideas to apply something so creatively tend to emerge, and sort of what are the organizations or branches of the government that tend to be kind of the most repressive? And which ones tend to be the most kind of sympathetic to your your activities, if there is any sort of general tendency that you have noticed? Well, we definitely notice that, for instance, an ombudsman is my uh, an ombudsman, especially. Okay, so the ombudsman, especially the previous one, uh, was uh, much more sympathetic to our work, and we are cooperating with her. And in many cases, she is very supportive. Of course, her her um, um, what she could do is fairly limited. But still, uh, she could win the cases. There is also there was also a council an advisory council uh, before our president, the the, the one that uh, made this uh, um, evidence that uh, having um, that um, that agreement, um, the tax agreement, did not what was a donation, a real donation, and was made uh, to, for the benefit uh, to the entire society. So that's a semi-governmental body, and uh, we used to work with this body a lot. And um, although it doesn't really have a real force, it doesn't really have the real power, but still uh, it has the power. So we were trying to work with this body. However, there is a new chairman right now, so we are not really sure whether this chairman will support our work because uh, he used to be used to show very conservative views. So we're not sure how it's going to evolve. However, of course, there are these um, agencies that are more um, repressive than the other. Uh, for instance, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and also um, investigation, uh, investigative committee, um, as well as the, the uh, Federal Security uh, Bureau. These are, in my opinion, uh, the most kind of repressive and uh, conservative bodies. And, for example, just using that case of like environmental legislation and legislation that prohibits cutting trees or something like that, do you know at which level, like sort of who had the idea first to apply that to, to basically target uh, activists? Well, uh, in my opinion, there was a local initiative, so somewhere, somewhere a local authority that wanted that. But I cannot, uh, in this okay. case, um, unlike in the case of um, <coughs> memorials, fines, I cannot pick a single body uh, which I think is responsible for that. What would they be seeking to gain? Well, uh, I think it's more about intimidation and um, a hindrance of work. Okay. Would, that, would there also be sort of power politics in play? Would the local office be looking to gain favour with like, the maybe, maybe that. structure? Yeah, and then maybe, maybe that. Um, because, um, s you know, sometimes I'm trying to figure out which is the logic behind certain actions, uh, whether it's just, uh, you know, the authorities are not doing something uh, that they have to do because they are lazy, so we can deal with the laziness, uh, or there is a higher end uh, to, their, um, to their inaction, and then if there's a high end, it's fairly, it's much more difficult to fight it. But sometimes we are able to figure, sometimes we are figuring it out during a battle, and sometimes it's just that completely vague, yeah, who knows, yeah. And on the foreign agent law as a whole, I mean, obviously it's incredibly difficult the circumstances you're working under, but um, 
it's it's not as bad as we first imagined when it first came in, if that makes sense. Um, so I remember when it first came in, it, everybody feared that it basically, you know, civil society would be gone and there'd be no way to resurrect it. Um, and I was interested in your perspective, whether you feel that's deliberate by the government, um, you know, leaving, being harassing as much as possible, but, but not eliminating civil society, or something has gone wrong with the plan that they executed, or whether they never intended to get rid of civil society in the first place. It, it's just an interesting sort of juxtaposition between what people were predicting early on and, and, and where we now find ourselves and, and the reasons for that. It would be interesting to hear any insights from that. Do you want to go for that question? Oh, okay. Um, um, well, my uh, understanding is that um, it's the same, the, the answer to your question is the same why Russia wants to be in the <coughs> Council of Europe. So it's more about the appearance. Uh, we want to appear good, uh, but we don't really want to act, act on this goodness. So uh, my understanding is that uh, the, the Russian authorities cannot just say that uh, we want to get rid of all the civil society organizations, um, and that's why we're closing it because we are not still we're not Azerbaijan where these things are possible. So we want to remain good on the uh, on the surface, but then uh, um, therefore uh, the, the authorities are trying to come up with a very creative way of how, for instance, uh, attack a memorial. And uh, the logic that they're using right now is the same uh, that was used against the, the KKK uh, Klan in the United States, where um, there were millions and millions of uh, claims filed against the KKK group to uh, take away the finance from this group, to take away the money. Uh, and that's what they're doing. Uh, they are uh, constantly filing new claims against Memorial uh, for new fines uh, to, get, uh, to make sure that we are left bloodless that we are uh, pushing, um, putting all our resources into this work mm -hmm. and paying as much money as we can. Uh, and it also takes a lot of your time, doesn't exactly. it? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it actually occupies yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. May I add one more thing? Um, it's uh, oh, um, if they just mm, dissolve all human rights organizations in Russia at once, it may lead to um, some uh, civil society mm. response to mm. some protests. But what they are doing, they are normalizing uh, mm. the situation. Because mm. uh, you see, uh, for example, uh, when uh, the when we start, we, by we I mean all NGOs, <laughs> not, not, not memorial only. When NGOs start getting this uh, enormous fines in 2014, 2015, um, it was uh, on the first pages of all media outlets that are not controlled by the government. Uh, by now, Memorial gets uh, fines like, that are like uh, five times larger than the fines uh, uh, organizations got in the beginning of the application. So, for example, uh, at that time, one NGO got one fine. Now we get like five fines per week. But uh, mm, almost no media outlet uh, writes about it because it's something extremely usual. And I know that uh, I, I remember how we were preparing for each uh, trial uh, regarding regarding foreign law, like four or four or five years ago. By now we're sp mm, speaking uh, like. Who we have two trials on Tuesday. Who wants to go there? <laughs> so, because we understand that we will get a fine, there is no uh, opportunity that uh, uh, the judgment is in our favor. So, uh, and uh, when uh, b before 2012, the fines for participating in an authorized, uh, it's not about NGOs, but it's about uh, the civil society in general. Um, before 2012, the fines for participating in an authorized assembly were relatively low. They were about like 20 euros. Uh, uh, at once, they were uh, increased, and uh, so there was a 10 times increase of these fines. And when uh, there were first mass arrests under this law came into, after this law came into full force, and when people were, were getting uh, the fines of 220 euros instead of 20 euros it was like oh everyone was shocked uh, and so on by now um, 
activists get uh, even notified and uh, it doesn't bother anyone because uh, the society meaning civil society in general meaning the society in general it um, <coughs> uh, um, get gets used to this situation so we have already got used to the fact that we have to report to the authorities uh, several ti uh, times uh, more, uh, more, more often than we used to. We have got used to uh, the labeling requirement. We have got used to the fines and so on and so on. Uh, maybe uh, five years <laughs> later we will get used to people getting uh, five year sentences and we will say yeah, it's five years it's, not, it's okay it's not 20 years yes. because uh, by now uh, I know that by now the most uh, how to say not progressive thinking but progressively thinking but um, the, the, the those who are the, mo the, the most realistically thinking they say to they tell the activists oh, oh, okay if you go to the unauthorized assembly, there is a, a low, a really low chance, like one or two percent chance, that you get a three year, uh, a, a three years imprisonment. Usually, it's around three years. Uh, there is a chance. The chance is relatively low. Uh, you should uh, just think whether you uh, are ready for this risk or not. After after serving these three years, you will have an opportunity. Uh, you will be uh, a political prisoner for the rest of your life. You will have if you will have an opportunity to leave Russia if you wish, and so on. So, it's a very realistic way of thinking. <laughs> if you are so uh, the um, conditions of this game uh, um, pretty understandable. It's not something like. Uh, uh, you you were doing nothing and then you were suddenly you were arrested and you got five years no you you, you understand that uh, but uh, the, the risks are high for example yes of course I, I understand that for 